Hello, I'm Stuart Goche, County Agent with the LSU Ag Center here in Lafayette Parish, and welcome to Get It Growing with the Lafayette Master Gardeners. Today we're going to do a show and we're dedicating the whole thing to orchids, and we have a special guest with us. It's kind of one of our LSU Ag Center orchid specialists, Mr. Robert Turley. We also have Ms. Janae Foley with us, who's in charge of our Master Gardener plant propagation. And we would like to welcome you to this show. We also do not at this point want you to panic turn off the television and say, huh, I can never grow orchids, because you can. The orchids that are available today are not the orchids of 15 years ago. They are being mass produced so well and so easily that you'll even see them seasonally in the supermarkets. Yes, would you have to educate yourself a little bit to learn how to grow orchids? The answer is yes to that. But fortunately, Robert here is here today to tell you all you need to know to get started in growing orchids. Or maybe, Robert, the first thing we can do is, is sort of talk about the different types. Okay, you realize there are over 30,000 species of orchids, and they're always adding new uh, species, new hybrids. Uh, the botanists are learning a lot more about relationships between orchids uh, with DNA uh, sequencing. So a lot of things are once had in this genus, now they give it its own genus, and swap. so there's all kinds of things going on in orchids. It's a fascinating study within itself. But some of the uh, orchids that yeah. are very popular, and, and I grow and you grow and some of the others, is basically our Cattleyas. This is a Cattleya intermedia. It's a species type, very easy to go, uh, grow. It tolerates hot, uh, hot temperatures, and it'll take cool temperatures. It's not going to take frost or excessive cold, but it will tolerate those cool nights without, uh, with, with some protection. Uh, this is another Cattleya. Some of the uh, black colors are very, very attractive. Lots of new things coming on. Orchid, Cattleya orchids tend to be a little smaller now because they're breeding them smaller for, for hobbyists. Uh, another popular one is, of course, the Phalaenopsis. You can go to any of your box stores, garden centers, and find Phalaenopsis uh, for sale. Uh, the thing with orchids is they're not like a, an iris or, or a rose bush. Uh, they're epiphytes. Epiphytes are plants that grow upon trees or on rocks with mosses in uh, cloud forests where there's a lot of humidity, but the roots are always dry. They're not in wet conditions. So you have to mimic those conditions, and there are different types of media, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Over here we have the Cymbidium, which is uh, a great plant that flowers during the winter times. Uh, there's a little trick on the temperature, but we can grow them outside uh, to get bud set uh, in the late fall when our cool temperatures ri uh, arrive. And of course, that will initiate bud, uh, bud growth. We have what we call our little botanicals. So these are all uh, grown on barks, various types of barks, cork, wood, and so forth are very interesting to a lot of folks. We have what we call the Oncidium Alliance. You have different types of hybrids, uh, all types of little interesting flowers, large flowers, and are very, very attractive. What you see uh, up here is one of the uh, deciduous uh, dendrobiums, probably in the, uh, look like a dendrobium nobly type. I have one back here on the uh, tree and hanging. This is one of the small flowering uh, Dendrobium nobly types. They require a coolness. You, actually, you can leave these out late in the fall, not where you receive frost on them, but where it stays cool. That initiates buds, and once they do that, you can bring them in and they'll go ahead and flower. Now, which one of these types are we more likely to see in your box centers or your supermarket? Well, your most common is going to be your Phalaenopsis. Uh, these are plants that do not like cool temperatures. They like the hotter temperatures. So, you cannot uh, let these go below 50 degrees, otherwise you will lose them. They'll turn yellow uh, leaves and then they'll die, but you need a warm place. That's why traditional orchids have been grown uh, in greenhouses where you can maintain these more uniform conditions uh, than sometimes we find in our, our homes unless we have a lot of bay windows and lots of light coming into the house. Okay. How about what will a failing offices do in a kitchen? It'll do good in a bright window, mm -hmm. uh, and where there's a, around, a, around a kitchen sink, or even a lot of people who have bright bathrooms right. where there's a lot of humidity. They take the lower light levels, 
but they still need bright light. They don't, orchids don't like direct light, but they want bright light as you can give them. And so they'll, uh, they gotta have light to manufacture chlorophyll just like all other plants, but it's a degree in intensity of orchids. When they bloom, how long can you expect a bloom to last? This, these here could last uh, anywhere from three to four weeks. And won't frequently, they'll and, grow. Uh, Phalaenopsis can yeah. last a, a month to two months. On this so you can enjoy them for, for a long period of time. And how often, if you're doing things kind of right, how often can you expect for um, these orchids to bloom? Well, uh, this particular species will flower on new wood. So if it puts out a new growth, it will, will flower. A lot of your newer cattleyas will flower twice a year. Twice a year. Yeah. Your symbiotums basically bloom during the cool period of the year, and you have different early through uh, mid-season through very late. I've had one bloom as late as May. Uh, they're more of a, a pot plant. They're closer to a terrestrial than any of the orchids, but they're still, they're not gonna grow in pure soil. Um, let's see what else we have here. Here's an interesting, this is um, uh, a Rincon uh, stylus, I believe. This is one of your uh, vandacious type plants um, uh, that flowers this time of year and has these beautiful little clusters of, I guess you call it kind of a lavender, it's kind of spotted and it has a little red lip. You can get a snow white one and there's a one that's kind of a violet red. Uh, they bloom in the spring or during the winter time really. Then some of your other types, there's very different sections of, of uh, dendrobiums. Uh, this is one uh, Dendrobium johnsonia. Uh, it's one of the evergreen types. Uh, this is being grown on bark. Now when we grow on bark, that means uh, you're gonna have to water this, especially in the summertime, on a daily basis. Because if you don't, then these, these pseudobulbs, which store water, will get real shriveled and uh, the plant won't uh, grow in, uh, pro pro properly. So you, you kind of have to um, develop a routine. And if you grow on bark, they need, of course, uh, moisture uh, most every day. Except in the wintertime, you might can skip a day or two, but you still gotta make sure they have moisture and humidity. Uh, you know, pass this uh, green one here. These are, this is one of your complex uh, dendrobiums, uh, they br bred them, crossed them up quite a bit, so you have some really novel uh, plants, and these will flower uh, if the temperature's right pretty well most of the year round. This here, you got a spike here, and it's initiating spikes. Uh, this is kind of a lime green, very interesting color uh, for orchids to find one that's in the lime green shade. Okay. How affordable is it to grow orchids for the average homeowner? Is it something that you can get involved with fairly cheaply? Or? Uh, well, you know, it's like any hobby. You, you tend to get in it and become uh, obsessed with it, so you, you, you spend a lot of money. Like anything, it can become expensive. Depends on how big you get into it. If you just have a few plants, then it's like anything else. Anything you know. else. Right. Uh, the thing with orchids is they're more readily available than they used to be, say, 30 years ago, because well, our major chain stores are carrying them, especially the Phalaenopsis. Let's talk a little bit about the different growing medias, and we have some here, and maybe you can point out some do's and don'ts and things you like and don't like to do <coughs> when trying to grow them. Well, let's show, uh, well first, here's a plant that's being grown in, uh, in uh, sphagnum moss. Usually it's the New Zealand brand is preferred, but you can grow them in any of the sphagnums. Uh, it's a plant that holds moisture and uh, keeps humidity around. The thing with orchids, you want to water them thoroughly. Then you want them to let them go get on the dry side. Not bone dry, but they need to get dry. You want that exchange of air around the roots because they're growing up on these trees. Their roots are never, never going to be saturated. So they like to capture the dew, the the clouds and the humidity in the air, and that's where the roots get moisture, and then they drive, drive their food value from the decaying organic matter on the trunk, so the old, of the tree bark. But here we're providing this as a medium, and of course we're fertilizing with a, a liquid fertilizer, something like 2020. 20, uh, I think to a teaspoon to a gallon, you can water. Uh, every time you water, you can fertilize a little, then flush it about every third or fourth water, and 
so you don't build up uh, salts. Most of the orchids you would you would purchase locally yeah. set up in the correct medium. Uh, well, you know, you're fast and get the. the Whatever you find them growing in, they'll grow. But a lot of times when you get into the mass marketing, they're growing something temporary to get it up and growing and sold. So you may want to go to your favorite media. Now, a lot of folks grow and just bark. Now, here's a media that says special orchid mix that you can buy at any of your garden centers. And it contains uh, various uh, pieces of redwood and fir bark, a little charcoal, some perl uh, perlite, and you have to watch a lot of times, a lot of these barks, they're not very good quality or good grade, and they're kind of dirty. You don't want soil in, in your media, because these are not terrestrial. They don't want soil. Soil will rot them. So you make sure you get a good quality bark or media uh, that you're using. I don't like bark because it decays. I've gone to a, I use kind of a, uh, a media that I learned from orchids and ferns in Houston a number of years ago. And it's basically, um, where's the one with charcoal? Do you have any charcoal in there? Okay. Well, anyway, I use uh, one part charcoal, one part uh, peat, one part perlite, one part uh, vermiculite. And you can, those ratios, you can stay with those. And if you have a plant like a phalaenopsis, maybe likes a little more, uh, a little moisture soil, then you can add, a, add another part peat moss. And when I dump this plant, my roots will always be white. To be, to be just like a, you can take it and repot it right back in another pot. A lot of times in bark is the, bark, the roots always rot, and you have to cut all that way, and it kind of sets the plant back. These plants are never set back because of their media. And that's why I like this, and I've gone to it. Repeat it again, Robert. One part charcoal, one part vermiculite, one part perlite, one part peat. Peat, right. And find you a good quality uh, sphagnum peat. Mm -hmm. uh, Coarser, if you can find a coarser uh, um, brand is a lot better than just one that's real powdery used for seedling and potting mixes for regular plants. Uh, now, did, did you want to talk about the uh, Cymbidium? Who brought the... Um, uh, our, our producer actually grows these and she uses horse manure. Yeah, uh, well, on Cymbidiums, uh, this, these plants right here, <clears throat> you can grow them in, this is horse manure and of course the horse uh, which would be a proper term to use on TV, a horse uh, poop. Uh, they're basically grass, that's all it is, and, they're, and you allow them, I guess, to dry. I, I know some of the Australian, New Zealand people really grow their cymbidiums mm -hmm. in, and they show them on the internet, and a lot of people have picked that up around the world. Uh, I basically use my mix. Either way, uh, they'll work. Uh, that's the thing with Argus. If you have to buy all these these uh, brand these potting medias from California and uh, mail order and bring them in, well, the cost of the shipping is is, is more than the media. Mm -hmm. So I always look at things locally that I can use that I can buy readily, and that it fits the need for the orchid. And that's why I have moved to the type of media that I have. That I can go I can go to any of your box stores. I go to my local garden center. They have those products. And pick up all those. Right. And, mm -hmm. and how often would we want to think about maybe repotting? Well, when your orchids, this this one here is ready, should be um, repotted and divided because once it reaches the edge of the pot, see, it, it's going to want to grow over. So you need to go ahead and uh, repot it, take off some of the old foliage. If it's got a lot of extra uh, leaves, then you can make some new plants. Okay. Now I've seen some of the vandas in the little basket type containers that don't look like they're growing in anything. Okay, here we, this is a, a vandaceous or vanda-like plant. This is uh, your renanthras. These are, are very tropical. They come from the Philippines, Indonesia. They have these gorgeous little spikes of bright red flowers. And what, and this is what we call um, monopodial growth. Your cattleyas have the sympodial, is that they grow across and these grow upright and these will just if they're attached to a tree in the tropics they just keep growing and growing and growing and they'll put out these spikes all year long because of the, it's a most of the climates are pretty warm or moderated even during the winter time so they will flower but this is uh, one of the vandaceous um, this is you know bring this one forward here this is another type of vanda these these plants your vanda, vandas don't like a lot of cold weather, so you have to 
keep them very warm, like the Phalaenopsis. Okay, uh, this is you get this very very attractive uh, spike, a beautiful flower. Sometimes the plants don't look that good, but the flower spikes are magnificent. And this looks like a complex hybrid. It looks like it has um, like probably some renanthra in it, and with van one of your vanda crosses. It's a very interesting plant. Uh, likes to be um, high humidity. You need to hose these down air every day and uh, feed them constantly with liquid fertilizer. Now, would you grow this in your mixture? That, uh, that no, was one this, of the these, questions I was uh, asking. You can grow these when they're small, and I have some bandages mm -hmm. in pots. I grow mine, I make these little wire hooks, and, wire, and then I hang mine outside on the trees in the summertime because they just, if you, they just do th thrive good in our summers. In, in a, uh, remember, they don't want full sun, but they want bright light. So you don't want to put them in full sun, but hang them where they can get bright light and not full sun. And you do want to. These take a lot more light, higher foot candles, but you have to be careful when getting, you may have to start with a little bit of shade, then move them gradually until they acclimate to the light. Otherwise, you'll get, you'll burn the foliage uh, very easily. What are some problems that you see in terms of insects or diseases with orchids? Uh, well, uh, orchids, uh, you know, they get mealy bugs and scale probably their biggest uh, pest that we get. Uh, using any of the systemics uh, we find like um, uh, uh, orthene or acephate will work, a uh, little malathion will work, it's, and of course, um, um, what's an, uh, the old uh, dimethoate worked pretty good too. Now, when we start talking like this, it, at this point, I always figure we've thoroughly confused people yeah. because we've, we've thrown so much information out to you. Where can you go if you're a beginning orchid grower? Somebody, say, gives you a, a, an orchid plant for Mother's Day. Where can you go to get some help locally? Well, uh, you're very fortunate in Lafayette that you have the Acadiana Orchid Society. Uh, they're a great place to start because they have a lot of folks who have been growing orchids for years and they they can help you with a lot of some of the doubts and questions you might have. Uh, and I would say if you've got a problem, I mean, bring your plant. If yeah. it's sick or if you're trying to care for it and you don't think it's it's doing well, actually bring it to their meeting. They meet uh, the third Monday okay. of every month at the R. Nelson Heart Center at 7 p.m. And, uh, you know, people who love particular types of plants yes. are going to help you to no end. You know, you're, you'll... You, you won't be, you won't leave uh, feeling that, that you were uh, looked down upon. You know, they will be glad to help you and answer your questions because all of us were beginners at one time. That's right. Is it hard to, to propagate orchids? Um, no, it's not hard to, uh, I guess what we need to do is take, do we have time to take out one, look at it? Yeah. Uh, this is, uh, this is an orchid. We'll just take it out of the pot. And here again, this is my mix. And look, I want you to look at those nice white roots. Oh, yeah, beautiful. See? Mm -hmm. uh, you can just take this pot out, out of the pot, and you just, my mix just falls right off. And uh, I got lots of healthy roots. But I can take these little, this, some of these little small, this was a young plant, and I potted up and grew. I'm going to take off all this back growth, which is. Uh, uh, you know, it's insignificant, and I don't see any active eyes because they've all been used up. And uh, so I'm going to just throw that away. But I can take this plant, and I can put it in this pot like this, mm -hmm. and then fill it up back with my media. Now, About how much you, larger would you go? I, I would, of course, you need to put it toward the back so you allow this front room for the plant okay. to grow for in the future. So th this would be a good size transition, though, oh, yeah. say, from That's the gallon fine. to oh, yeah. this. You got, you got uh, maybe one or two, three leads in there that are going to really fill this pot. But this plant is not set back by loss of roots. It will never know it's moved. So it'll just keep right on growing. And a lot of folks like, to, I find, uh, is, I like to use these, uh, the, you know, we always wonder what to do with these peanuts we get in our little packages. Well, that would go good in here because it keeps uh, your media aerated. Or it gets like air around the root, so it's not like the other plants. So you want air, a kitten, you put your plant in the backfield with your media. Uh, I like to water once and set it aside. How, how 
firmly do you compact your media, or do you let it be I, loose? Well, when you're, I, when I kind of tap the pot and just settle okay. it around and work it in lightly. Be careful not to break the roots. Mm -hmm. And then I may just firm it a little bit so the plant doesn't wobble. Okay. okay. Now, in clay pots, we have these various metal clamps. Do we have any metal clamps? Oh, they use them. I don't use them. I usually use a little stake if I need, if they're floppy, mm -hmm. like this right here. We tie the spikes. I use that sometimes. There are, there's all kinds of little things you can do. Uh, that don't cost a lot of money that's laying around your shop or your garden or the, the garden shop, and you can uh, improvise a lot of these things. That's what I do. Now, do you have to be careful in tying the stems to a stake? <clears throat> yes. Uh, you need to start early. Don't wait to this the spike is leaning over too far because you try to pull it up. A lot of times you can break it if it's not very uh, sturdy and uh, catch it when it's growing and then you can uh, make sure the spike's growing up right. A lot of them will grow up depending on where the light is on them. Yeah, we might show this yeah. one. This is just a larger version okay. of those phalaenopsis. Yeah. Well, the phalaenopsis uh, naturally arcs anyway. And if you have this in a window, it's going to grow toward the light anyway. And you, if you can just visualize this plant with a large a tree with a large limb over a stream in the, well, in the Philippines, and they're all just coated on this limb, and these large sprays are just hanging out off that uh, branch over that stream, it'd be absolutely gorgeous. That's the way they like. Like the buoyant air, humidity rising, and uh, that's what you want to try to. Does the other sites online that people can reference? Well, the American Orchid Society has a great site. Uh, they list probably the Acadia Orchid Society as local sites. So there's all kinds of information on every every kind of orchid that you'd even want. Uh, so the internet internet's a fabulous place to start. And the American Orchid Society specifically. Right. Yeah. Can you plant the seeds from any of these orchids <clears throat> and start them that way? Uh, yes, you can. But uh, here again, uh, the seeds are. They don't have a seed coat like you think of a bean or a grain of rice. They're strictly an embryo, so, and they're very dust-like, very fine, and there's millions of them come out of a pod, and they float around with the air streams, and they'll land on a tree trunk or a fence post. But there has to be this fungus that's there that creates an a symbiotic relations to provide the food for it. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't occur, the, 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 seed, the little seed doesn't germinate, and they say, one seed out of a million will make an orchid plant in its native habitat. But uh, with uh, your, uh, what's, the, what's the word? Uh, Tissue uh, culture. As aseptic or septic yeah. conditions, you have to, like in laboratories, they have to be planted on a, a nutrient solution auger under very sterile conditions. Otherwise, if you get mold in it, it'll kill your seed. But it's, a, it's quite an ordeal. And if you're interested in that sort of thing, American Orchid Society is a great place to start in the, uh, or your local orchid society. I know there's a few people in, um, in um, uh, Lafayette, even Baton Rouge, that do hybridized orchids. So that'd be good places to start if you want. And I've heard that. that's kind of a long process too, huh? Up when to, you start from well, seed. I've seen Phalaenopsis bloom out of flasks two years, Cattleyas seven, seven years. Seven so years. There's a, yeah, so you're doing, in other words, For most people, yeah. buy maybe a plant. get you a little plant and right. get started. Yeah. And then right. it's also, I would think, there's maybe some variability or you're not really sure what you're going to end up with. Right. And I would point out, too, you know, some people that might get one of these orchids as a gift really doesn't want to continue growing it. <laughs> you know, they can enjoy it. It's going to last as a cut flower would last. I'm sure that, you know, somebody in their neighborhood would be delighted to be gifted with that plant or, you know, bring it to the Orchid Society and they'll find a, a good home for it. You know, right. you know, every plant is not everybody's thing. You know, we'd like to encourage you to learn to grow orchids if you're interested in it, but if not, enjoy it, like I said, until the flowers aren't there and then right. re-gift it. <laughs> and all of these orchids are, are just beautiful and they'd make some very nice pictures. And there's a photography contest coming up for, with Festivals of Plurid. Maybe, Janae, you can tell us a little bit This about is that. the first year that Festival is having a photography contest. They are asking for eight by 10 photographs to be mailed to 510 East Butcher Switch Road by March the 28th, the 28th of this month. There are two categories. They will accept pictures of flowers and other horticulture, and there are two age categories, 
for school children and then adults. Prizes will be awarded and all of these pictures will be displayed at festival, which is April the 5th and the 6th at Blackham Coliseum. You know, I know we'll have gorgeous pictures of, of orchids. We'll have gorgeous pictures of roses coming in. So that's another, you know, treat available for you at a festival. It's possible we've had vendors at festival with orchids. You know, the, the vendors change from year to year, but it could be. It's a good place to learn. It's if you're a good interested place to, to learn. network with people, come out to festival to flower. And um, you definitely can learn not only about orchids, but a lot of other crops. I think we're kind of winding down on time today, but we want to thank our guest, Ms. Robert Turley, always. for coming here today. It's always a pleasure. I know you've been a guest on our show before and um, definitely enlightened us about, about growing orchids here. And if you have any questions, feel free to call our office at 291-7090. Thank you. It's been Stuart Goche with Get It Growing with the Lafayette Master Gardeners. I got your title, me. Hmm? I got your title.